Welcome to Every Night is Game Night, a proud member of the Dice Tower Network and the home of the Headspace Game Review. We are the podcast that helps you get your head in the game. Every Night is Game Night, episode 176, games that help you help others. Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome back to Every Night is Game Night, the podcast that helps you get your head in the game. I'm your host, Jason. Thank you so, so much for joining me. It's me solo in the chair this time, and I cannot believe that I have taken 176 episodes to do this particular topic. This is games that help you help others. If you are any kind of listener to the show, you know that I am a psychotherapist in my real life. I see people on an individual basis. I have my own private practice here in Connecticut, and I use board games in therapy. I have been using board games in therapy for about a decade. That's as long as I've been in active practice, and I can't believe it. (laughs) I have never done an episode where I kind of put together all of the board games that I use in therapy. I've done it in bits and pieces in the episodes. I've been on other podcasts. I remember talking about this on the Thoughtful Gamer and the Board Game Design Lab, but I've never really put together my thoughts in terms of using board games to help other people. Obviously, I'm doing it as a clinician. Uh, I have a different perspective on it, but I'm hoping by sharing some of my insights that you'll get some ideas if you know somebody who's struggling with anxiety, depression, attention deficit, these different things that people go through, then I'm hoping that this episode will have something for you and you'll be able to share it with your loved one so that you can use board games to help somebody, which is the absolute best thing that you can do with a board game, in my opinion. But first, we are going to get to Liz and the Liz We Trust segment. I have a special love uh, for this particular project. I request that Liz do it when I uh, showed her the Kickstarter page. She also uh, <laughs> gave me a comment that about how delightful this little project is. It's from Genius Games. Uh, Liz, tell us all about Genotype. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here to encourage your Every Night is Game Night Acquisition Disorder. This week I want to talk about Genotype, a Mendelian genetics game, soon to be published by Genius Games. In Genotype, you and your fellow players are research scientists working at St. Thomas's Abbey, and you'll be working with pea plants to collect data about genetics. The game is a combination of worker placement and die rolling. You'll choose actions you want to take during the work phase, then check on your data by rolling dice during the breeding plants phase. After that, you'll use any funding you've acquired to further advance your research. In the solo mode, you'll be playing against Brother Johan, an automa deck designed to mess with your carefully laid plans. If you're into games that make you feel clever, both as a gamer and as a would-be scientist, then Genotype might be for you. Check it out before the campaign ends on February 27th. Happy gaming. I love Genius Games. I've reviewed many of their products on this very show, Periodic, Subatomic. I haven't reviewed Covalence, but I enjoy that one as well. Uh, the, the whole science thing, maybe it's because I'm a psychotherapist. I'm a giant raging nerd when it comes to this, some of this stuff. I really do appreciate when they give uh, different genres a try. Um, Cytosis was their game. I haven't played that one. I'm interested in doing so for worker placement. This one seems like another kind of spin on worker placement. Looks like so much fun. So please go ahead and look at the Kickstarter page for Genotype and see if it is a project for you. All right, so let us get on to the meat of the show, which is games that help you help others. So uh, two very, very big um, asterisks on the what I'm about to present. I'm a psychotherapist, but this isn't like research. <laughs> I'm, I'm not presenting anything here as, you know, this is gospel. This is the stuff that you need to be presenting if you want to address some of these issues. I just have done this for a little while now, and this is what I've had success with. Uh, And this is completely personal. It's completely tuned to my particular clients and their particular situations. And I'm hoping that there is some transferability in terms of the people in your life and how you would want to help them or even help yourself. Uh, So this is in no way authoritative. This is just, you know, me spitballing and sharing some of my experiences. And I'm hoping that resonates with a few of you out there. 
second thing is if you are suffering from some of these things, if you do uh, have some anxiety, depression, if there's some uh, other things that are going on for you, please go ahead and seek professional help. Uh, uh, part of this is tongue in cheek. I mean, if if someone is presenting with serious symptoms that I'm not throwing down a board game in the middle of therapy. I mean, this is just uh, another tool in the box that I use. It's among many, many tools. I have, you know, I'm a cognitive therapist. I use cognitive interventions. I use behavioral interventions. I use all sorts. Of, I use exposure therapy. I use narrative therapy, <laughs> all sorts of different interventions. I mean, the, using a board game as an intervention is very specific. It's for a low level of severity of symptom. If you are experiencing something, please go ahead and contact somebody and get the help that you need. As much as we all love board games, it does not solve all of the world's problems. So I want to just make that very, very clear from the outset. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is actually a review. I saw this game. Uh, it is called Brainwaves. It is from Thames and Cosmos. I requested it and I played it and it was actually the it was actually the, the what led me to think of doing this episode in the first place. You'd be surprised. I don't really have a lot of discussion topics. I play a lot of games. <laughs> and discussion topics and perspectives kind of emerge from gameplay. Another way in which gaming has just been amazing and a blessing in my life. So uh, I'm going to talk a little about brainwaves. And I'm going to connect it to uh, some of the other things we're going to present later in the episode. But first, let's talk about this product. This is Brainwaves. Uh, I received one copy, which is called the Astute Goose. Uh, there are three different versions of this very small card-based game for one to five players. The version that I received was designed by Dr. Reiner Knizia. Yes, uh, Dr. Knizia, you know him from many, many games. He's been designing prolifically since uh, the 80s, I believe, somewhere around there. I actually really admire him as a designer, which, if you know anything about me, is kind of shocking because his games are very famous for lacking in theme and lacking in any kind of imaginative engagement. It's really a bunch of mechanisms. But what I like about Dr. Kinesia's design philosophy overall is his games tend to be very simple but have a lot of depth. Uh, he uses one or two mechanisms to accomplish many, many different uh, game experiences. The strategic headspace that a Knizia game puts you in is very wide, even as the barrier to entry is low, which is, I feel like that's in the secret sauce in terms of why Dr. Knizia is such a popular designer. So let's talk about Brainwaves. It's a memory game that's designed to encourage cognitive functioning. So the way it works very, very basically is you have a deck of cards and the deck of cards has a man on it. And the man, I think the idea is that it's a criminal. It's like a suspect in a crime and you're trying to pick out what he was wearing and, you know, what was going on. So there's the, so the different cards depict him at different states of dress. So he, at, so he can have different colored shirts, you know, blue or green or yellow. He has different types of neckwear, a tie, a scarf, a bow tie, that kind of thing. And there's also, just for the silliness factor, uh, the, an animal on the card. So like a goose or a rat or something like that. So all these cards are in the in a deck. You'll deal out a number of them depending on how hard you want the game, less for an easier game, more for a harder game. And the game challenges you to remember what's on the cards. You flip the cards over and then you roll dice. And the dice, one is a number. So do you flip the cards over depending on what column they're in, one through three or one through four or whatever. And then you also roll another die about a feature. So you'll roll the dice, it'll say three, a neckwear. So then you have to remember what was the third card wearing on their neck in terms of neckwear. Was it a tie? Was it a bow tie? That kind of thing. Or you could roll one animal. So what was the animal that was depicted in the number one card? That's it. Very, very simple. It's a step up from a um, regular memory game in the best ways. I really enjoyed this product. Uh, it challenges people to exercise their memory muscle in a very, very fun gamery way, which is great. One of the things we're going to talk about, the first section of uh, the stuff that I do in therapy is help promote cognitive functioning. This one does a good job of kind of coming at the memory angle in a different way because you have the dice and you also are challenging people in very, very specific ways. So uh, there's a couple of categories within memory that I found that uh, this was really good for. One was spatial memory. So you have to remember, you know, like, you know, the, the one card has this going on and then the three card has this going on, four card that has this going on. And they're all like laid out 
on the table. Spatial memory is really, really important. I was, I was actually reading something the other day where it talked about spatial memory and reading. So when you're reading a book, and mostly a physical book, not so much online books, but when you're reading a physical book, it actually employs your spatial thinking a little bit more than you would think. You know, think back to when you were in school and you know, the teacher would ask, uh, okay, uh, class, we're going to go back a couple chapters. Remember when this chapter said this sentence? Uh, you know, we'll go back to that and discuss it. So if your spatial memory is working, not only you re- will you remember the concept, you'll remember like where on the page, where on the page, the physical location of the idea. So once you have that going, you kind of drift back there a little bit faster and you have a little bit more facility with whatever the concept is. It helps in reading, it helps in processing. Spatial memory is really good and this game promotes that, which I really appreciated. Another thing that I noticed, and I'm fairly terrible at this, so <laughs> uh, so that's why it stood out for me, is the idea of chunking. So one thing that you want to be able to do in order to process a lot of information is chunk them into like categories of groups. So there's this there's this thing in psychology where you can only remember about seven things, seven discrete things at once. Think of like your memory is like seven buckets. You don't get like nine or 10 or 11 buckets. Like you get seven or whatever it is. That's why phone numbers tend to be seven digits, at least in, here in the States. But within those buckets, you can actually jam a lot in there if you can chunk like sets of information. This game does that. This game has this game challenges you to say, okay, cards three and six have blue shirts. If a three and six comes up, I'm gonna remember that there's blue shirts there. Uh, cards one and three have the goose. Card two and four have the cat. As you're engaging people in the game, and as I engage people in the game, I would, you know, and if they struggle, I can kind of point them in the right direction and say, okay, figure out where you can gather categories that are alike. Just kind of remember them in a cluster. And it was it was good. Like I mean, I would you know, play a couple of rounds of this, and and I noticed that people were kind of learning that little trick, and it's a nice little way to exercise that quote unquote memory muscle, which is which was a really really fun thing. So Brainwaves, I really like it. I can recommend it uh, for those of you who are in the market for a more gamery memory game and also one that might appeal a little bit wider than your gamer circle. Uh, you were not going to play this game on a game night. <laughs> this is definitely for um, people who are want to work on their memory, who want to kind of exercise that muscle, and also in particular people who may need to exercise that muscle. Maybe you have somebody who's a little bit older, they're losing a little bit of cognitive functioning, um, uh, heaven forbid they're struggling with dementia or Alzheimer's or you know this accelerated memory loss. Uh, this is a this is one kind of advanced way to help engage them. My one criticism, my one thing that I'll note um, is the art style, the the man in particular. So uh, the other games, there's two other games in this line and they work slightly differently from what I read. I can only comment on this particular product. It, it features a man and the man, it looks like a criminal and it was a little bit off-putting for people, I'll be totally honest. I mean, I'm thinking of one person in particular, you know, say, okay, could we try this game? And they said, oh, <laughs> That doesn't look very attractive. I think I'm going to uh, move on from this. I'll say a little bit more about this in just a second. My most successful games, my most replayable games, tend to be abstract. They tend to uh, depict things in terms of colors, and numbers, and shapes. They don't get into depictions that can be affected by cultural things. I can definitely tell there's a European product, and in that particular context, I'm not European, so I don't know, uh, it may not be as jarring. But when I brought it into this context, you know, here I am in the States using this, I had at least one client who said, I don't like the look of that. So I almost would rather have wished they had depicted just kind of an abstract you know, shirt with a tie or, you know, without in the human inside of it. Uh, and then, you know, the animals and everything. And also from what I know of, you know, games like this, you play it a couple of times and the actual image disappears and you're playing the abstract game. So the art style is only there at the very, very beginning. Eventually you play the game enough, you don't even see it. Uh, but that initial barrier, if you're looking for something that grandma might want to play, that was something I noticed. Uh, that's that's the only thing negative thing I'll say. This is the best gamer memory game that I've played. It's pretty applicable for my situation. So I'm going to give it a recommendation. That is Brainwaves, the Astute Goose, uh, one in a line of Brainwaves games. Go ahead and check those out.
All right, so I'm going to get to the larger category. The first category that I'm going to tackle, uh, this is helping folks improve and maintain their cognitive functioning. I'm a fan of a series called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, it's a book and it's a seminar and all this kind of stuff, kind of self-helpy, but a, a really early tried and true one. So I really appreciate what it does. Uh, and one of the habits of a highly effective person is called Sharpen the Saw. Uh, so sharpen the saw is the term they use in order to talk about this very thing. Uh, keep your brain sharp. Keep your mind sharp. There's a lot of activities in which you can engage in order to help people or help yourself keep that saw sharp. On the activity end, you're, you're looking at puzzles, uh, static, non-gamery, uh, you know, you struggle through it and there's one answer type puzzles. Those are amazing and wonderful and completely and utterly underrated. We're talking crosswords, word jumbles, uh, word searches. Uh, if you're looking for something to pick up that's a little bit easier, I find that word searches have a very, very low barrier. So I definitely recommend those. The most frequently occurring puzzle in terms of somebody who wants to just spend hours disappearing into a thing, uh, maybe they're a little bit older, they're retired, they you know have a lot of time in their hands, or they're in some kind of facility and they don't, <laughs> there's nothing but time if you're in a facility. A jigsaw puzzle. Man, jigsaw puzzles are so cool, so much fun. Uh, you get a series of them. You get a really beautiful one or, you know, you theme them out. Maybe your uh, person is a world traveler and you can kind of help them recreate their experiences while traveling with different uh, scenes depicted. Your person wants to be outside, so you give them some nature scenes. Um, there's so many ways in which a jigsaw puzzle, a really good one, can slide in there. The big barriers when it comes to jigsaw puzzles, the first is you maybe you don't have enough space to you know do the big 500,000 word uh, jigsaw puzzle. And the second is that one and done. So, you, you, you know, it seems like a poor investment. You buy it, you finish it, you're done, you move on. Uh, one thing I will recommend, and our local library actually does this, uh, one of the local libraries does this, they have a puzzle shelf. So it's very clear, it's marked, so there's... It has a bunch of puzzles and it's one in, one out. So if you do a puzzle, you can put it into the shelf and you can take another one out of the shelf and that's your puzzle now. It kind of runs in the honor system. There's a sign that the librarian put there saying, there were this many puzzles at the beginning of the day, please let there be this many puzzles at the end of the day. Hopefully they're all different so people are using it and trading puzzles and everything. But I really can't recommend enough. If you're looking for something to engage somebody, keep that saw sharp, keep that cognitive functioning, exercise that, exercise some of those uh, muscles in terms of puzzle solving and spatial reasoning, all that kind of thing. Jigsaw puzzles are definitely the way to go. This is not every night is puzzle night. <laughs> this is every night is game night. What games are available out there that can also serve this purpose? I mean, there are lots of low barrier puzzly card games. The one that I use most often is a game called Set. Set's a decently old game. I think it was released around 1988. Very, very simple. It's a deck of cards depicting a bunch of shapes. So like, you know, one, two, or three shapes. And the shapes might be squiggles or circles or ovals or something. And the different colors and they're filled in different ways. Some of the shapes are solid. Some of the shapes are clear or they're lined. It's just a, a series of these symbol things. Y you lay them out in a grid and the different people who are there have to pick out a set of whatever it is. So it has to be a set of either identical things, either like you know, identical frequency, so one, 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 or identical color, you know, red, 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 or exactly opposite sets. And you have to, you know, kind of look through the whole card and, you know, complete your set. You pick it up and you deal out three more cards and then, you know, you kind of resume the game that way. So simple, but that's what I want. <laughs> I, I don't want to have to spend a whole bunch of time explaining the game. I want to, you know, just explain it in a couple of minutes. I only have 45 minutes in a session, and most of my clients aren't gamers. They're just kind of along for the ride with me. Uh, so, you know, just a couple of words, describe the game, and then go. I really, really like set. It's portable. It's kind of definitely in my portable toolbox of games that I carry with me a lot. I can mention a whole bunch of other like kind of little puzzles. I mean, uh, I'm a big fan of like Rummy Cube and you know, Scrabble. You know, the, all these games that, you know present puzzles in different ways. If you want to kind of arc it up in complexity and you want to arc it up in immersion, uh, so this goes way on the other side of talking about abstract, abstract. Here's something that you know presents and it has a whole lot of like you know bells and whistles going on. 
I've had a decent amount of success with escape room games. Escape room games are long. Uh, I only have 45 minutes in a session and I, it tends to be like, you know, we'll play like the initial puzzle or two and get them into whatever the escape room team is doing, usually like an exit or an unlock because they're so small and so portable. But oh man, <laughs> in terms of encouraging that puzzle sense, and I actually had an experience where, you know, I'm, you know, I suppose who's experiencing some, you know, distress and everything. So not necessarily towards the cognitive piece, but, you know, towards the more mood disorder stuff. And I, I was talking to him and I, he revealed that he likes puzzles. So I brought in a escape room game. We went for 45 minutes and we did a couple of puzzles. And by the end of it, his mood was like, whoa, this is so cool. What is this? This is so much fun. This is an escape room game. Here are some meetup. Here's a local meetup that we have that does escape rooms, like actual escape rooms. It's like, oh, man, you know, that might be the thing I need to kind of connect and have a good time. And even if it doesn't work out, at least I, you know, had a good time with this. <laughs> it was so rewarding and so much fun. And in terms of that engaging puzzle experience, that might be a really good way uh, to bring some of that in there. I've not played a bunch of escape room games. I tend to kind of use the same one over and over, which, by the way, uh, I might be reaching out to people <laughs> if they're uh, for their used escape room games so I can uh, have those kind of lying around and use them in therapy. So so escape room games, very, very highly recommended. The last category of games to talk about, you can use a whole bunch of games, but this is like the stuff that I've had the most success with. The last category of games I really like for this purpose are simple dice rolling games. Dice are amazing. It wasn't until I really started seriously using games and therapy and thinking about them and how I can, you know, maximize their use that I really started to notice how amazing dice games are. Um, you know, they're tactile. Uh, you roll them, the numbers, you can kind of manipulate the numbers and you can challenge people to kind of add numbers a certain way or calculate odds. And <laughs> But in a context of like, you know, being exciting and fun, uh, there's a reason why, you know, dice are kind of the oldest game piece in human history, literally. Uh, you know, I think the, you know, games of stones were discovered in ancient Egypt or something like that before even the first board games. And my number one dice game that I use in therapy, especially in terms of folks who want to improve their cognitive ability is Yahtzee. Yahtzee is so great. The arithmetic there is simple. The calculation of odds is simple. It's, uh, you know, people kind of roll and they can push their luck. Do we have a small set? I'm going to push it towards a big set. And, you know, this is my odds say this, but I want to roll this. <laughs> so, I, you know, I mean, I've had success with people who are even limited, like pretty limited in their uh, reasoning and their memory and their calculations and everything, still, you kind of engage them through it. I'm thinking of a couple in particular, older couple, the, 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 the wife has, you know, some early onset stuff going on and the husband's able to talk her through it. And it's, it's just been, an, it's just an amazing thing to watch. Uh, another game that I've had fun with, it's a little bit of a hair more complicated. So just kind of keep that in mind, but I really, really enjoy this one. Can't stop. Uh, the old Sid Saxon game of just, you know, rolling dice and pushing luck. And it's it's a little bit more exciting. I, I, you know, good luck finding a copy of that one. You might have to comb the bargain basement bins or something. I'm talking about dice rolling and what is the current trend in board gaming right now? Roll and write. Tons and tons of roll and writes. You'd be surprised though. I've tried a couple of these in sessions and they tend not to go over all that well. They tend to be a little bit too gamery for the average muggle non-gaming person out there. The one that I've probably had the most success with is called Quix, Q-U-I-X-X. -X. Another simple, abstract, puzzly, you know, game with low overhead. It's just numbers and colors and you don't have all the bells and whistles. It's just like, okay, let's just roll dice, assign uh, where I think it'll be the most advantageous and let's roll again, and, you know, do the simple calculation of odds. That I just love. Uh, using quicks uh, in therapy as an alternative if I want, if I'm tired of Yahtzee, which believe me, <laughs> I've played enough Yahtzee in my life uh, at this job. The final one I'll mention, uh, and this one's super fun, The make sure that the person you're helping is is willing to kind of engage something with a little more pizzazz. Uh, this is King of Tokyo. Uh, I love King of Tokyo. I've played this with all sorts of people, young, old. If you're going to go the dice route and if you're going to go uh, something with, you know, that's exciting, low overhead, I minimize the cards or I, you know, because there's a lot of cards, a lot of power. So I definitely kind of take out a 
good majority of the cards and I use the cards that are the power cards that are the most simple extra head or whatever it is you want something with as low overhead as low explanation as possible I really recommend King of Tokyo which is basically Yahtzee so <laughs> so if Yahtzee is good King of Tokyo should be good right so just to review, we're talking about cognitive functioning, sharpening the saw, making sure people have that good cognitive functioning, puzzles, puzzly games, some dice games, some escape room games, some suggestions for you in case you want to help that person or even help yourself. Just like you can just do, you know, just make us make room for this, make room for this along the way. And you will definitely reap the benefits as, as you go on and, you know, get a hit the later years. All right, so the next category that I'm going to talk about is engaging teenagers, going to the other end of the age spectrum, so to speak. Uh, teenagers happen to be near and dear to my heart. Those pains in the butts. <laughs> I laugh because so many of my uh, clinician friends and coworkers and peers, they don't like working with teenagers. They're so frustrating. It's uh, often the work is slow going for me. Uh, and maybe because I'm a kid at heart, I play board games and video games and everything. I'm practically a teenager, uh, only a teenager with bills, <laughs> so to speak. I, I really do get along with teenagers. And I, uh, a part of me just wants to, when I see a teenager who's struggling, who's struggling to connect or struggling to find their niche in the world, I, I have all this uh, desire to kind of help them through their life cycle. So the perspective that I use in terms of teenagers tends to be a life cycle. Um, perspective. So I'll explain what a life cycle is. So life cycle is um, based upon a psychodynamic theory by Steven Erickson, who's speaking out of the Freudian perspective. His theory was that the human being goes through these different developmental phases throughout their entire lives. He split it up into eight phases. And in each uh, of the phases, you have one task that you're trying to accomplish, a primary task anyway. Uh, so when you're a baby, you're learning how to trust the world. And when you're uh, in your elementary school age, you're learning how to be productive, and engage in homework and task and all that kind of thing. When you're a teenager, the task is to differentiate yourself. The task is you've spent all this time in a family unit, in a cultural unit, that's been your identity. Now you are trying to be your own person and that's where the pain in the butt aspect comes from which is so frustrating but for me i i really resonate you know yes i know they're being a pain in the butt but that is a feature not a bug <laughs> teenagers are trying to individuate themselves that's the key insight i use that drives my main gaming approach with teenagers which tends to be competitive card games not cooperative you're not you know joining together as one the teenager is is doing the exactly the opposite to individuate themselves and card games why card games card games are very individual they're far more individual than a board game i find in a board game you're thinking like you're monopoly or you're thinking you know, i'm looking at my shelf right now with the, bo the big board of scythe or the big board of Forbidden Desert, you know, name your game with like a, you know, a central area where people are interacting. In those type of games, it's, you know, people entering into that space and manipulating it, but nobody owns it. It's all shared and there's dynamics and push and pull. And this that's not where a child, a teenager wants to be. What Where they want to be is if they're going to enter that space, they kind of want to do it on their own terms. And a card game really replicates that very well. Think about it. In most games, you're dealt the hand and the hand is secret. Okay, I am an individual. I am assessing my resources. And in a lot of games, you are slowly unfolding your power one card by one card by one card. And in a lot of games, you're not really playing cards to a common space. You're playing cards kind of a personal space, that quote unquote personal tableau, which is one of those funny gamer terms that I have to explain it. I say tableau to a mogul and they're like, what's a tableau? <laughs> uh, us gamers have to be really careful about our jargon. So the, the, the youth is engaging, they slowly play, you know, on their personal space in many, many games, not all of them, but many of them. And they're slowly kind of revealing their power and their identity. I'm thinking very particularly of a game that I play a surprising amount, which is Magic the Gathering. So I am not a Magic player. 
I played a couple of hands in 1993, 1994 when the game was first coming out, and then I was out. <laughs> Pay to win? No, thank you. However, as I've done this work, you know, and Magic is just kind of blown up and it's continuing to have a lot of purchase, especially among teenagers. I'll invite a kid to come in and, you know, they'll bring in like a dueling deck or they'll uh, create, you know, a deck. Oh, you know, you play this and, you know, I, I like to I want to see how this deck works and I want to see if it does what I want it to do. So the deck construction is part of it, but definitely the head to head begin with a secret set of resources, slowly unfold yourself to the world in your time. Uh, and then when you're ready to really start interacting, then bam, you've, you've spent that time, you've built yourself up and you're, you're interacting with the other person on your own terms, which is a really weird, you know, kind of interpretive overlay that I'm putting on the card game experience, but I've seen it work, man. I mean, just look at real life, you know, teenagers aren't playing board games they're playing magic or they're playing card games, at least in my experience, if anybody disagrees, then, you know, please, uh, reach out to me and we'll have a discussion. Not everybody likes magic. What else do I use? So it, it, usually in the card game vein, uh, with a younger teenager, you know, we're talking like, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old. I like a game called Tales and Games, the Hare and the Tortoise. It's a, these card-based racing game. You kind of lay out the a little track and you have betting uh, with the five meeples. So the meeples are kind of just independently racing, like automated by the cards you play, but it's not like you're Con directly controlling your character. Uh, you're controlling the characters and you have a secret uh, animal that you want to win, that secret. So you're kind of like, okay, I'm gonna you know, push this, the wolf one, I'm gonna push the uh, sheep one or whatever. Whatever the characters are, and of course you have the hare and the tortoise. And that's a super, super fun one. I really, I still play that, uh, the hare and the tortoise a lot. Uh, it's really good. Amping up a little bit older, I feel like I mentioned this game a lot. I mentioned it again because I do use it a lot. Star Realm slash Hero Realms, depending on, uh, I'll use whatever version I think the person will uh, vibe with the most. Deck builders put a particular spin on that growth idea. So I mentioned, you know, you have your hand of cards and you slowly unfold it. And that is a kind of a metaphor. It reenacts this kind of like, okay, I'm determining the pace at which I reveal myself to the world and I'm growing my power alongside of it. Deck builders, you're doing that within your deck. You're making your deck bigger, and it has that added option, which I find that and any, and any adult enjoys the buying of cards. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, retail therapy is absolutely a thing. A lot of people engage in it whether they want to or not, whether they have the means or not. Here's a time where it's like, you know, you play your cards. Now I have all this money and I can look at these options. It's a very, you know, individual experience. You know, I'm not helping you uh, do the shopping. You're determining, you know, what kind of things you want yourself and putting them in your deck. There's a lot of deck builders that you start off because it has the lowest overhead. It fits in that little tiny box. I can teach it. Again, the, the prioritizing games that I can just teach very quickly and that pack up, you know, when they, they, they set up fast, they pack up fast and they have a lot of punch. Uh, you know, I only have 45 minutes. I got to maximize every minute I have in the experience. A little bit more involved. If the person is feeling whimsical, I might use a smash up. I don't love smash up, but Hey, Ninja Dinosaurs, if some, if somebody wants to play Ninja Dinosaurs, you know, by all means, uh, a great head to head, a little bit more mental game that I use is Raptor. Raptor came out a couple of years ago. It's a two-player asymmetric game of, you know, kind of cat and mouse, try to get into the other person's head, which is definitely something a teenager wants to do, you know, figure out the adult, <laughs> so to speak. A graduated version of that in some ways is Skulk Hollow, another asymmetric game. Man, I, I the, the more I'm talking, the more I realize I do love asymmetric games for this purpose. Uh, you know, it definitely helps differentiate the teen and the adult. So Skulk Hollow, uh, you know, you have heroes on one side and like a big bad monster on the other side. And the heroes have to crawl all over the monster and stab him. And the monster has to fight them off. So it's nice to kind of recreate some psychodynamic things in a therapy setting. I'm sharing all these games, but let's be real. Let's be honest. These are a drop in the bucket compared to the game, the one game, the one card game that I play the most. And that is uno yes uno if you're going to engage this work be prepared to play <laughs> lots and lots of uno i've resigned myself to it at this point there is something about the collection of things going on in uno that is allows for teenagers to be so engaged and there's so many levels at which uno is working the initial draw of cards 
you you don't just get your cards. You have to kind of order them. You have to, you know, turn them right side up. And you have to put the colors together. You have to put the numbers together. You set your draw fours and whatever to the side. Just that little act in itself is just like, okay, now I have my resource and I'm individuating them. What do teenagers want to do? They want to individuate themselves. And that just, that little, you haven't even started the game. And they're already kind of putting their stamp on something and, you know, determining the way in which they're going to engage the the game itself. Another way that the team can individuate themselves in Uno is house rules. Who plays Uno the same? Every single, it's like Monopoly in a way. Every person plays Uno slightly differently. Do you play straight up or do you play with stacking where you can stack like numbers? Do you counter with draw two? Can you play a draw two on top of a draw two? Uh, When you don't have a play, do you pick and pass or do you just keep on picking and you have a just giant hand? (laughs) I mean, there's a lot of different ways uh, that Uno can play out and everybody has a different one. I like to give the teen an opportunity to kind of set their house rules, another way in which they can individuate themselves. Then, you know, there's the gameplay itself. It's not like, you know, some strategic thing. It's just a light, breezy, fun thing. Uh, the team can be a little bit mischievous. They can, you know, set up, set themselves up for a key draw two or draw four, some kind of, you know, chain of different cards they can put together. I cannot believe I'm going on and on and on about Uno, but I've used Uno and it's great and it's fun. And if you want to prioritize connecting with a teenager rather than just, you know, playing the best games, if you're prioritizing the connection, which is exactly the priority when it comes to, you know, working with teenagers, then, you know, (laughs) who am I to reject the tool uh, that I find to be very effective? All right. So that was working with teenagers. The next category, I don't have too, too much to say, but I definitely did want to throw it in here. Uh, Inattention hyperactivity, that cluster of things that we formerly know as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I will put out there right away that I'm very unsure when it comes to this particular concept because it's so overdiagnosed. You know, uh, people say, oh, uh, my ADHD is acting up or uh, my child is so hyper, he must have ADHD given medication. I really do see a lot of people kind of defaulting to the medication option, to the uh, medical treatment option. And it could just be hyperactivity or it could just be, um, you know, lack of focus or it could be they <laughs> their attention has been withered to nothing by the phone. And, you know, it's basically an ADHD generator, uh, that thing. And I love my phone. I use it a lot. But man, it really does cause a lot of uh, difficulties in this work. So, how do you help a person focus? How do you help a person settle down and not be so hyper? My general approach when it comes to this scenario is ADHD, it, whether it's, so whatever it looks like, whatever is going on, it's going on in the mind and you counter the mind with the body. You help them be present. You help to be mindful of the present moment. Uh, you hear a lot about mindfulness, but I especially find it useful here because the mind is so hyperactive, it's so focused on this, that, the third, the fourth, and the fifth thing, you get them to focus on the now and you might get some results. And the way you do that in terms of, you know, bringing them to their body is you engage that kinetic sense, you engage their hands, you engage their tactile sense. And I tend to do that with dexterity games. I love dexterity games for this particular purpose, and there's a lot of decent ones that I use. Uh, I used to see kids who are young, younger than teenager, but I've imagined this intervention also worked with the young at heart, uh, a game called Coconuts. Uh, Coconuts is a game in which you have uh, monkeys, and the monkeys kind of have these spring-loaded things. You're flicking the coconut into a cup. (laughs) Very silly, very stupid, but, you know, hey, it works. You get to be a little bit older um i don't use this one anymore because the setup is very is much of a is very much of a bear uh but rampage slash terror in meeple city um i think the newer ones you can get a catacomb you can get a flick them up dead of winter which i believe came out last year or the year before uh any game where you are just you know you're flicking things and you're destroying things i mean who doesn't want to do that that's pretty cool Ice cool I've used uh, for kind of uh, once you get to like the actual teenagers, you know, ice cool is kind of lame. But if they're younger, 
Uh, they want to be running around and catching the fish in the school and everything. Ice school is very fun. A game along these lines that just recently came out, a Mega City Oceania from Hub Games. You have this, you know, uh, I, it's hard to describe, but you're you have this thing. You're kind of aiming it at the city, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in the middle. You're kind of knocking them around. Uh, very, very fun one there. I mean, I could go on and on. I mean, basically any dexterity game uh, could work for this. You use your favorite one. I mean, you have Meeple Circus if you're uh, if you really want to get thing make things silly. You have Junk Art if you want to kind of promote a little bit more calmness and you know more geometric thinking. The one that sings to my heart the most, the one that I've ha- used the most and I've had the most success with, it's, again, meeting those things that I've been saying over and over again, simple, e- low barrier, easy to teach. Rhino Hero. Oh, man, I love Rhino Hero so much. It's just, it's a stack of cards and the cards are made of like thicker cardboard and you can bend them and you make a tower out of these cards. And the cards look like an apartment building. And as you're building up the cards up, you have this little Rhino Meeple uh, the Rhino Hero, and he goes up and up and up. It's so appealing. I've had many, many different clients use this one. And I remember specifically, I had this one uh, young man. He was about 20, 21 years old. And if anybody, anybody in the world had actual ADHD, it was this guy. He <laughs> interrupted his functioning. He was a poor guy. I mean, he would, you know, he was very loud. You know, we would talk, and all of a sudden he'd be slamming the table and just like exclaiming, and that's what I'm talking about. And everybody in the office would hear him. I mean, he would you know, he was loud enough to kind of interrupt other people's sessions, even though it was all closed door. However, when I engaged him in Rhino Hero, he was able to focus. He was able to shut all that noise out and just make his whole world about what was going on in front of him, in his hands, with his eyes, trying to accomplish the building of that tower. And it was exciting. It was fun. It was engaging. And... It was actually so striking because when he came in, we play a game of Rhino Hero, and then he, then the client would leave, and then my um, coworker would come in and say, uh, "I thought you saw that guy, your ADHD guy," uh, but it was so quiet. <laughs> I said, "Yeah, he used the game of Rhino Hero. That, that really kept them quiet." And uh, you know, over time, you know, you the, the person like it, it's one of those things where you have to like kind of build up. Uh, you know, with the, with the cognitive thing, you have to you know practice and practice and practice, and it gets better and better, and you stick with things, and it, it, you do see the difference after a long time. After you know using these interventions and other interventions as well, uh, you see the, the difference in focus, the increase in focus, more skills to complement whatever medication you're prescribed for ADHD. So general principle, um, if they're focused, if their mind is wandering all over the place, pull them back to the present, pull them back to the body, with a great dexterity game, great for focusing. All right, so that was how I use gaming as an intervention in that particular case, ADHD. These last two subjects are a little bit tougher to talk about because they're so big. We're talking about anxiety and depression. So they're tough to talk about because I think on some level, everybody experiences it. And on some level, most people have no idea (laughs) what's going on. Um, So everybody has experienced nervousness. And sadness. These are natural reactions. These are natural emotions uh, reacting to whatever situation is happening in the world. But anxiety, you know, there's nervousness and then there's anxiety. There is sadness and then there's depression. These are two very, very different levels of feeling. I, I do the best that I can to distinguish them in turn, but I just want to kind of lay out uh, that these are very, very difficult things to talk about. So let me take anxiety first. What is anxiety? And like ADHD, it's one of those overused terms, right? You go to any high school, you go to um, different areas in life, and you're going to hear somebody say, oh, my, my anxiety is acting up, or let me go take medicine for this anxiety. I'm just so plagued by anxiety. The term is so overused that it's not even clear what it means anymore. So let me try to break down at least my perspective in terms of a clinical approach to what anxiety is. Anxiety is a root of biological reaction. It is your fight or flight system, which is located or centralized in your brain stem. It's like the most bottom root, oldest part of our brains. Our fight or flight system is responsible for keeping us safe. It's responsible for responding to some kind of threat in the world. So the threat could be, you know, physical, you know, a bear in the woods or something, you know, uh, ah, so something really scary that's physically scary that can hurt us uh, in a real profound way. 
But also there's lots and lots of psychological harms that are out there. You're afraid of being embarrassed. You're afraid of uh, being exposed. You're afraid of being separated from the group or um, there's some kind of psychological harm. Or maybe you just don't, you don't even know. You can't even identify what you're afraid of. You're just afraid. You're just fearful. And that's where anxiety kind of lives. That that system, that fight or flight system is kicking in and it's shooting out all sorts of adrenaline into your body and it's making you have all these very physical sensations. Your your heart is pounding, you're short of breath, you're tense, you're sweating, you're nauseous or some kind of cluster of those symptoms and either it persists all through the day or it happens in like these waves like you're okay but then you get kind of this, this panicky feeling and... I'm trying my best to describe <laughs> in words what it feels like, and it sounds pretty bad just from the words. Uh, believe me, the actual experience of anxiety is so much worse than anything that I can describe. It's just this root sense in the bottom of your gut that says, I am not okay. I'm not okay. Any intervention that is trying to get at that sense and help people through that I find the most effective is to come at it from the orientation of helping somebody feel safe and at peace again. The anxiety reaction is a re reaction to some kind of harm, whether they can identify it or they cannot identify it. They're, something inside of them, either consciously or unconsciously, is perceiving and reacting to harm. They're Fight or flight is kicking up, which is ironic. They're not fighting or flighting. It's more like a freeze. <laughs> and it, it, they're not doing anything, but they're still the that reactions and the the shortness of breath is still kind of, you know, there and you know, taking control. So helping the person feel safe, feel like they are okay, feel like they can be okay, feel like they can settle down, that there is no psychological harm out there that the space is safe and they can let go. I find board games to be particularly effective with this because of this concept of the magic circle uh, inside of a board game space is the circle where the rules are all laid out, whether the rules of the game, but also kind of the social contract of of gaming you know we're not going to we're not going to be jerks at the table you know we're going to go in we're going to take our turn and you know there might be some flex in there but for the most part when you sit down at a table you especially people you know the social contract is there and the the safety of the rules are there like we talking about the safety of the rules that's a really important thing to emphasize like okay here we we're safe here Let's be in this game. Uh, in reference to, you know, what game can help with anxiety. I mean, any game can help with anxiety. I mean, just your favorite games or, you know, something that encourages that say, that sense of safety, that sense of okayness, that sense of, okay, I belong here. I don't, there's no harm waiting for me here. I can relax. I can exhale. So that's so particular to the person that it's just hard to think of a, any concrete recommendations. So um, I do have a couple of thoughts that I've found helpful just in my own personal experience, whether it's myself or helping somebody out. Um, one observation is I tend to like games that are about nature. There's something coming about nature. I, we're born for nature. I mean, I'm understating the case. I mean, we're born for this and we actually live a very un natural life many of us live in a natural life you know if we live in the suburbs i live in west hartford you know which is you know hartford a city uh i'm basically a suburban living every bit of nature that i do encounter is very manicured and curated i definitely notice a difference in my mood when i'm getting out i read somewhere that being around trees and around water running water or you know so kind of like big natural body of water is so healthy you know just kind of you you're there and you let the biodiversity kind of interact with your uh biological organism it, it's there's some really important research that's actually uh tuned to you know people who are spend more time in nature they're healthier so can a board game replicate this absolutely not you cannot replicate uh, a natural experience with a board game it's kind of like antithetical However, I, I have encountered some board games that I can speak for myself that I find very relaxing and I find just kind of like put me in a good, relaxed headspace. 
Sunset Over Water, I've mentioned a couple of times on the show over the course of the last couple of years. I love Sunset Over Water, very sedate, calm, puzzly experience. I recently discovered another game, very, very recently, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, called Parks from Keymaster Games. Anthony reviewed this about uh, four or five months ago on the podcast. Uh, I got a chance to play it. I've been playing the solo. <laughs> Uh, you're playing these hikers and you're walking down a path and as you're walking down the path, you're gathering resources like sun and water and you are using those resources to buy uh, different things. You're buying like gear card, but you're also buying the pictures of the parks, which are your points, with victory points. You know, you're trying to build a portfolio of beautiful parks that you visited. Oh, man. <laughs> parks is a great one. Parks is very, very relaxing. Puts me in a really, really good space. It means it's not just an enjoyable experience. It's it's touching something in me. It's it's evoking something, evoking a sense of like, okay, the, the world is okay. There's beauty in the world. And if the world is okay and the world is peaceful, then I can try to recreate some of that within myself, which is a very, very powerful experience. So yes, I can I do get those reactions just from from, from a board game depending on the board game. It better have good art. <laughs> it needed to have good art. Uh, and Sunset Over Water and Parks definitely have excellent art. I can name a, I can name a couple of other ones too. I'm looking at Wingspan too. Uh, I don't have that same experience with Wingspan because I'm not a bird guy. I'm from New York City, so like every bird is a variety of pigeon to me. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. The nature stuff is definitely more uh, resonant with me. Uh, but whatever it is, whatever you do, and I guess I'm trying my best to give both concrete examples and like the general principle so that you can find your own examples. The general principle here is understanding anxiety as this threat reaction, uh, whether the threat is physical, whether the threat is psychological, whether the person can name the threat or whether the person is just like afraid of, in general and they can't really pinpoint what it is. It's the sense that they're under threat, the sense that they're not okay, they're not safe, and it's in their body. <laughs> and it's an actual physical reaction of things that are flowing, you know, uh, adrenaline and all the different chemicals that, you know, um, kick in threat response. If you want to try to relax that, then do whatever you can to make the person feel safe. Any game can be a magic circle. Find the game that can appeal to that particular sense of safety and peace for them. I'm going to mention something here very, very quickly. This is not something that I really recommend that people do. <laughs> the, 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 the safety thing, yeah, you try, do the best that you can uh, in terms of helping people who are anxious. But this particular thing I just wanted to kind of throw out there in terms of using a game in therapy and in a very counterintuitive way, but how using a board game can help. Within the field of anxiety treatment, there is a kind of subcategory of helping people deal with specific phobias, which is which is the case, which is the thing where they're actively anxious about a certain thing, like they're afraid of heights or they're afraid of spiders or whatever it is. There is a train of treatment uh, that we call exposure therapy. So exposure therapy is, is a clinical, skillful path of exposing somebody to the thing that they're afraid of, thereby inoculating them, so to speak, helping them build resilience to the thing, and hopefully, ultimately, reducing their fear. What does that have to do with a board game? Some board games have subject matter that's very anxiety-provoking. You think about Pandemic, it's this game that's been around for so long, 2008, it, you don't even think about what exactly it's representing. Um, it's just cubes, it's just meeples and running around, but really, like, think about it from a fresh set of eyes. You know, someone who's initially encountering this, they're still kind of looking with the grappling. With, they're still grappling with the theme and what it's all about and getting an entry. It's about pandemic taking over the world. It's a hugely, hugely anxiety provoking thing. I mean, as I record this right now, we're dealing with uh, China and in some ways the entire world is dealing with this outbreak of this coronavirus. And I will be perfectly honest, I am getting clients into my session, either they are or they know somebody who is worried about it and they're anxious about it. It's like, oh no, you know, uh, what's going to happen? You know, they, they found a couple of cases down in Yale, which Yale is only a couple of miles down from where I practice, Yale University. 
disease is very just in general is a very anxiety provoking event uh, fires you know being caught in a fire or losing your possessions and you know uh, flashpoint fire rescue is a game that is really at the heart of it dealing with a very anxiety provoking situation so i spent a lot of this section talking about the games that could calm us down there are some games out there that can actually increase a person's sense of anxiety and I have <laughs> used these games and a couple of others uh, that are escaping me right now. And I'm sure there's more that you can use that are kind of more real life based uh, themes. I have used these games to help a client key up their anxiety, uh, key up their anxiety about pandemic, about disease. I've used Pandemic the Cure. It's a shorter game, easier to teach. The dice are more fun. And I get them exposed to the, the, the thing that they're, they're really afraid of. And, you know, uh, uh, the, we're keying it up in session. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And then it's like, all right, let's calm ourselves down now. And then when that process happens and we implement the skills, we calm down, we kind of process the interaction and we process the experience. And I point out, wow, you went through the anxious reaction. You went through, you felt all the feelings, you felt the surge of adrenaline, you felt the tension and the, and all the uncomfortableness of that anxious reaction. And you were able to get yourself through it and you were able to uh, calm yourself down. And I know this was like a, a contained experience. This isn't the real thing. This isn't ex being exposed to real pandemics, but really, are you going to be exposed to a real pandemic just because the news told you to, which by the way, news in America generates so much anxiety <laughs> that is like anxiety 101 is turn off the news <laughs> turn off politics turn off the local stabbings and uh, muggings and all the stuff that happens on local news just turn that stuff off uh, and stop the anxious inputs complete sidebar <laughs> i know this was a very safe and contained way in which to experience this kind of anxiety but you did it and we were able to get through it and the chances are very good. You're not going to have coronavirus or whatever other virus. Uh, and if something like that, God forbid, happens, we're going to keep on practicing this technique and we're going to build your resilience and we're going to build your ability to handle when you get that anxious, keyed up thing going on. That was a very, very poor representation of the process of exposure therapy. I hope you get the general idea. And I must emphasize, do not try this at home. <laughs> I just put this out there. So uh, another way in which I use board games in a therapeutic setting. We are at around the 57 minute mark. I when I sat down to do this episode, I thought I was going to be able to bang this out and have a 35, 40 minute episode for you. I can't believe this. <laughs> I can't believe how badly I undershot the runtime for this episode. And we haven't even gotten to uh, the thing that I probably know the most about, uh, both uh, professionally in terms of my uh, treatment and personally, as I have revealed in a previous episode, uh, talking about depression. So I'm going to make a little bit of time to talk about this one. So like anxiety, depression is one of those things that just it's too big for a description. Uh, that is universally applicable and it's too big to come up with some kind of broad-based treatment or general recommendation for which games would be uh, most beneficial here. And I'm not actually here going to talk a lot about depression, A, because the runtime is getting long, and B, I did say a lot about depression in my previous episode, episode 136, which was my personal chat, where I talked a little bit about my struggles. But just as a, a general framing thing, depression is different from sadness. It's very, very different from sadness. It's this uh, a sadness. It's a natural reaction, and it comes and goes. It's temporary. But depression, it, it's almost like the... Uh, your low self-esteem or whatever it is you're feeling just feels so permanent, feels so like a fact of the world. I'm feeling low, I'm feeling worthless, and no one can convince me any different. I could see the happiest thing in the world and I'll find a way to crap on it <laughs> in terms of my mentality. That's kind of how the depressed mind, uh, that's one of the ways in which the depressed mind works. So let me get into one aspect of depression treatment that I like to engage in. That low self-esteem piece that I was mentioning, that idea that I'm nothing, I'm low, I refer to it as like being, feeling like a replacement level human being. I'm here, I'm existing, but I don't matter. I, all my friends, 
they do their thing and I'm part of that friend group, but they can just replace me with another person in there and no one would notice. I'm a cog in the wheel at my job. I've accomplished nothing. I could disappear from the earth tomorrow and, and no one would feel a thing, really. The most success that I've had with addressing that particular cluster of ideas, actually RPGs and sto and open-ended storytelling type board game experiences. How I tend to think of all that is it's almost like a narrative, right? We're telling ourselves a narrative that we don't matter. We don't matter. Sometimes you just need to completely just take yourself out of that situation, release yourself from the prison of your mind that's just like this relentlessly telling you these negative things and enter into a whole different space, just completely escape. Where anxiety, the idea is to kind of create a, a safe space. When it comes to depression, you want to create an escape from that negative thinking and just put yourself into a more positive space, a more affirming space, a more powerful space. You enter into that magic circle, as I was describing before, where the person does feel powerful and they do feel worth it. And I find that storytelling does a lot to kind of hit that bullseye in a very specific way. In most role-playing games, you're the hero. Uh, in most role-playing games, you matter. In most, you know, when you create the world, you're almost creating the world around that person. It's like exactly the opposite uh, story of being in the real world and feeling like you don't matter. You know, in this beta up world, the entire world is reacting to you. And yeah, and I know escapism gets this kind of bad rap. You know, you don't want to just escape your problems, blah, 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 blah. All you're trying to do is you're trying to help the person see something different and think differently. And then you bring them back into the real world. You don't, you never disappear. You, you change that narrative. In the real world, you're a zero. In, the, in this, uh, this made-up world, I'm a hero. And somewhere between those two things is the truth. But you have to give them the polar opposite of what they're experiencing in order for them to get to a point that's somewhere between zero and hero, which is actually a healthy, functioning human being. I used to play role-playing games a lot when I was a kid, uh, I, especially D&D, &D, but you know, other systems like Shadowrun and uh, a few others. Uh, there's so many systems out there right now I, can, I, I haven't even attempted to keep up or you know, drop in and see what's out there. I, I go with the straight-up D&D. Uh, fifth edition is nice and modular and low, low, you know, again, low barrier of entry, low rules. I uh, don't have a whole bunch of things, complicated things to explore if I don't want to. Uh, so if I'm going to engage in an adventure, it'll be some kind of theater of the mind situation where we just kind of role play through a simple adventure or we might use, you know, something like the Rory Story Cubes. Uh, Rory Story Cubes, nice to just, you know, roll them and we kind of improv our way through a story. Uh, obviously, with the per you know, I try to make that person the central character and the story evolves that way. Uh, if you don't make them a character, if you just make it a story, then it's just a fun exercise. The point is to put them in the imaginative headspace of, of the hero so that they can do that zero hero tension dynamic and hopefully emerge with a third thing, a healthy human being. One way in which I've approached the situation, and this was a complete accident, but it ended up being really helpful. There was one uh, young woman, uh, about 19 years old, who I was engaging in uh, the therapy process, and we were going to do a role-playing game, so we made a character, but we got so much into the making of the character that that ended up being the whole session. So we made a character, and it was like, okay, if you were a D&D &D character, what would your stats be? So strength and con and int and everything. So what we ended up doing was kind of like talking through what her stats would be and where in real life she would give herself all eights and sixes and fours in every single stat in the D, D world she's like hey i'm pretty i am pretty smart i'm gonna give myself in 16 or in 15 or whatever she did and i've been through a lot i'm really you know i, I haven't i don't really think of it that way but i am kind of tough for making it through all the stuff that i've been i'm gonna give myself a high constitution what does that make me <laughs> what class does that make me and we ended up kind of thinking through and imagining this a uh, wizard, this elementalist wizard who calls down lightning and is very tough and and all that kind of thing. And we uh, we didn't adventure, we didn't do anything. We just made the character and imagine what that character would be and do. And then at the end of session, it's like, that's you. You may not think that's you, but that's you. 
or at least somewhere between that f- invoker, you know, elementalist wizard of, you know, fiery and lightningly death and the young woman who's here and who feels low on themselves, somewhere between that is the actual truth of who you are. I hope that as you carry both of those things with you, you can kind of go through that process and find that healthy balance. I had my personal chat. I invited uh, Thomas Grogan, the Mega Meeple, onto the show. He shared his personal story, his personal chat. Uh, we both over, have overcome depression, and in both of those stories, role-playing games were involved, and that is not an accident. Uh, it's re- <laughs> I can't I can't emphasize it enough. I, do, I owe a lot to role-playing games. Uh, I use them in therapy. I'm a DM. I do theater of the mind, or I'll do like a little short thing. I, I like to play in that space. I'd love to play even more in that space. Uh, don't have a lot of role playing opportunities right now, but I'm always going to have that in my back pocket. Um, there's a lot more that I can say about depression, but we are really, really long. <laughs> We're about a minute six into this. You guys know I like to keep ENG into under an hour. And this was a, this episode was really important to me. Uh, I really wanted to, after 176 episodes, put it all together. I've I've dribbled it out here, there, everywhere. The things that I do in therapy, the ways which way I use board games in therapy. Uh, so aside from the therapy, this is a, a love letter to board games. You know, this is a love letter to board games. You know, I love the fact that I have all these extra tools and they're fun. Like I can actually go into the therapy session and look forward to it and have fun. I have so many people that look at me and they say, how could you do your job? It's so, de- it must be so depressing. It must be so frustrating just hearing people complain all the time. It has its moments. There's times where I'm not at thrilled <laughs> to go uh, listen to 12 clients, you know, kind of complain about their day. But, you know, I, I, I there's a magic to it. Uh, there is a, a satisfaction that I get from really helping somebody. And every once in a while, when I can get away with it and bring a board game into it and not only play a fun game, but have that game help in the healing process for somebody, man, it doesn't get any better than that. So... So I love you to board games. I love you guys. Uh, Thank you so much for listening uh, this much. And thank you so much for engaging with the content. If you want to engage more, uh, I recently had a listener reach out to me, Michael Fenton. Hopefully by the time this episode uh, releases, then I will have gotten back to you. He sent me a private geek mail saying some really nice things about the psychological content. So this one goes out to you, Michael Fenton, and anybody else who enjoys these episodes. If you uh, want me to continue, if you want me to hear certain things, or if you have any reactions to this episode, please hit me up. ENGN underscore podcast on the Twitter, Every Night is Game at Facebook group, Every Night is Game at dot com, the sister of board game is anonymous dot com. While you're checking out BGA, check out their Patreon. The Patreon is the part of the reason that we even exist. Uh, BGA does the hosting for this podcast, which is not free. This is not YouTube. Podcasting does have a cost, and VGA covers that because of the Patreon. Thank you guys so much. Uh, if you want to talk with me, you can talk to me over there. You can also talk to me at the One Stop Co-op Shop Slack. Uh, that Slack channel uh, is a very thriving channel, a lot of conversation over there, and they were good enough to open a separate dedicated channel for Vinatis Game Night. Those are the means to contact us. Uh, please do not hesitate. I love talking to you guys, and I love board games. So until next week, go ahead and grab one of those games off of that shelf, and let's make every night a game night.